final chapter of Second Corinthians. Okay, what is this? What have we done so far? Well, we know that Second Corinthians is a almost near the end, the last letter, near the last letter of Paul to the Corinthians. It was also a very vulnerable letter, if you notice, a very personal letter. It's almost like a, uh, like Paul says, he was writing in tears in this letter. Uh, it's a show that he was uh, vulnerable. He was very open. He uh, shared with Corinthians his uh, struggles, his sufferings, his pain, physical pain, spiritual pain, mental pain. He was in depression, like um, one uh, N.T. Wright one, uh, once said and penned, uh, and we quoted that he was on a nervous breakdown. Now, folks, question for you, right? Brian, uh, pa- uh, Brian was leading worship today, and he quoted that verse and, uh, near the end, which we will quote again. And it says that we suffer together, right? That's what he said. You know, like Paul says, we're suffering together. Question for you. Do you have enough fellowship, koinonia, community, amongst yourselves right now that to do the same thing as what Paul did with the Corinthians. To actually go and say and is it write or pen a letter or write an email or just say, look, I need a chat and just say, say, here are all my weaknesses, my sufferings, my pain, my struggles, uh, my uh, like everything, my tragedies, what I'm going through. And are, do you have enough koinonia amongst yourselves, community, trust to actually share that with others, with your fellow Christians here? That's a question to ask yourselves. Because Paul certainly had trust with the Corinthians. No matter how, <laughs> it's like, remember 1 Corinthians? And, so, and the, the Corinthians, you know, they, it, it seemed like they had a horrible relationship, right? It seemed like, uh, like Paul, like we never read anything about Paul, like all through all those letters, Paul seemed to be yelling at the Corinthians. <laughs> Right, trying to correct them and correct them and correct them. But then we realize in Second Corinthians, he's sharing his sufferings and struggles. Like there is a particular trust, meaning that in our church, in church communities, no matter how bitch slappy we get, you know, like how no matter how uh, shitty it has, like no matter how much shit hits the fan, we can actually have still that trust. Because why? Because we're family, and family is messy. Agree? For those who are older, <laughs> right? We know that families are messy, but families have trust. They love one another. It will always be messy. And so do we see ourselves in this church, in a church community here, do we see that in light of all the messiness, in light of all the shortcomings, in light of your, the quirkiness sometimes, do we still see our brothers and sisters a way that we could trust them with our weaknesses? Trust them with our sufferings. Trust them with our own tragedies and loss. Are we willing to share that and find support here? That, and that's what the challenge that Second Corinthians has given us, what Paul has given us. See, this type of thing is messiness, <laughs> right? Can we actually uh, like, uh, continue to trust? Can, um, can a husband and wife continue to trust when they're almost on the brink of Nervous breakdown, <laughs> right, on that area. So see, family is messy. But can we overcome that and oversee that and then find koinonia, find a way to share? Now, I know that we also started with this letter saying that uh, this letter is also about Paul getting uh, the Corinthians ready for the offering, right, for the money they're collecting. Yes, that is true. Uh, if you read through the, the, the whole uh, letter before, uh, in your whatever previously, uh, it is a, a lot about the collection. However, that's just the top of the veneer. Because really, I found that uh, as we were journeying through this letter, it's a lot about navigating through pain. And how does one find comfort in God in light of the ongoing pain? Because this pain did not go away for Paul. Remember? Last week, we said that this pain did not go away even when Paul prayed, how many times? Three times. Question for you, just out of the, off to the tangent. Who else prayed three times to remove a certain cup? Jesus. Right? right? Who else? Like, so it is, it is interesting how uh, Paul said, like when we were looking at last week, how the message from Satan 
that messenger delivered a message and that message was saying, God, you're wrong, Paul, you're going nuts. You shouldn't follow uh, Jesus' pattern of life because this is, like, look at the suffering that you're incurring. Well, guess what? Jesus faced the same thing. He was heading to Calvary. He knew that God wanted him to go to Calvary. And then he prayed three times for that cup to be removed. And yet God did not remove it. Parallels. Right? And then if you want me to go into the Old Testament, ask me later. Right? There's many allusions to the three times questions, the three times tempted of the Jews, three times temptations of Eve at the, at the garden, three, whatever. Three is a really popular number in the Bible. Trinity, for instance. Right? All right. Now, before we begin... Let's uh, review what we covered in the beginning of the second half of 2 Corinthians. For those who, may, uh, who weren't with us or who may have missed them, uh, between chapters 1 to 7, don't worry, uh, all the podcasts are available on our website from chapters 1 to 7, if you want to look at the, I mean, listen to them. So feel free to go ahead to our website on that. But right now, we're going to cut, uh, just do a uh, review from chapter 8 till now. All right, so chapter 8 and 9 was about how to find comfort in God when we are faced with the frequent dilemma of not having enough, but we should feel that we have enough. You get it? You know what I mean? Like, Christians are supposed to feel content, right? And we know that we're supposed to feel content. We know that's the, uh, that's the attitude, right? But then, uh, frequently, almost on a, sometimes, like, a, for myself, like, almost like a whole week's worth, I, I always feel that I don't have enough. And then uh, I'm convicted again, constantly, by God saying, no, you are supposed to be content. So there's that dilemma, that struggle, that pain. So, how, so in those chapters, chapter 8 and 9, we were exploring how does one find comfort in that dilemma, that ongoing dilemma? How, did we, how can we reduce that dilemma? Right? Because like I said, uh, a Christian journey is like a muscle. Right? Uh, we have to work it right, to, in order to get stronger. Right? And we have to continue to work it and work it and work it. Same as our faith, same as our uh, disciplines, whatever, right? We have to work it. And so, same as contentment. Contentment is a muscle. So how do we work that? Well, Paul says, first, in order to find contentment, we, it's, a, it's all about an attitude. And an attitude of gratitude. It's an attitude of gratitude. The best way to overcome this is to actually have an attitude of gratitude. And how do you do that? It is to, first of all, remind ourselves what we already have in Christ. And if you want to do that, just read Ephesians chapter 1 to 3. Oh boy, there's a lot of stuff that we have right now as we speak. Because we are in Christ. Just reread that. If you ever feel that you don't have enough. If you ever feel that, is this whole Jesus thing worth doing? Just read Ephesians 1 to 3. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. And you'll, and you'll see why, how much you have in your possession in Christ. But second, it's also this, that God has a wonderful promise for you as you are living today. Not just like a, our outlook in the future of eternal life and, our, and glorious bodies. Yes, that's great. It's awesome. That's what we're supposed to look forward to. And we're supposed to be content of that. But, he, but as if we deserve any more, he goes and says, I will give you more. I have this one big promise while you are still alive, and that's that he will sustain you. Yes, he may not feed you like, a, like he, may not, he may just give you a sandwich and not a sushi, but he will sustain you. He will keep you alive, right, for his purposes. And what's more is that when we looked at that in chapter 9, whatever you do for him, what did he say? Will flourish, will abound. That's what Paul would, so word would say. That whatever you do, if you follow his ways, if you obey him, and if, if you remain uh, faithful to him, he will actually allow your work to abound. Biggest example that I gave was our community day. Wow. It was abound. Right? We didn't realize how many people showed up until suddenly the music played in and we go, oh, okay, we're going to be definitely out of ice cream. <laughs> right? So, abound. Okay, so there are two things then, right? Remind us of what we have in Christ, the seal of the Holy Spirit, the deposit that we have already paid for, and then also God's promise that whatever we do for him will abound, will be flourishing, will allow others to flourish as well. This is a lot, and which means that if that means that we have, wait a minute, you go, wait a minute, John, but we never lifted a finger, though. 
we didn't really deserve all this. Exactly. And chapter 8 and 9 was all about grace. It is about receiving grace well. In order to find comfort in God, in light of the dilemmas that we have, of not having enough, but we should ought to know that we should have enough, is actually to receive grace well. And those two points that I just gave you is how you receive grace well. Right? And it defines grace for us. Chapter 10 was about dealing with pain of comparison. How many of you have been compared before? Feel free to raise up your hand. It's like, it's just, yeah, you know, it's not like a rhetorical question where I'm the only one that raises your hand. Right? Right? Chapter 10 was all about that. Paul said, now, and then, so the key thing about here is that Paul said, it's a war out there. The war of this world. Remember that? In chapter 10, he, like, we highlighted that. It's the war of this world. And what is this war? It's this war of just the seeing others telling us that we're not measuring up to their standards. Oh, you know, why don't, you, why don't your kids play piano? Because my kids play a piano, right? Or why, kids, uh, why are your kids not at like, uh, some, uh, give me something here, like uh, what's that math? Cumon, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, or why is your kids not like, uh, you know, oh, my kids have these many stickers at Awana. How come yours don't have enough stickers at Awana, right? Or my kids go to Awana, your kids don't, right? Et cetera, right? Uh, that's parenting comparisons. But we've been compared too. How come you can't be like that coworker? How come, how come you can't hit those targets like your coworker does? How come you can't uh, like, uh, sell more than that guy? How come you're still single? Man, you should be married by now. What's wrong with you? <laughs> right? That type of thing. Or, or for uh, some parents, well, how come you only have one child? You should have two, three, four. Right? Comparisons. And I'm sure that we have much more comparisons, and some are even worse than others. Right? And we feel hurt, that pain of being compared. And so in chapter 10, Paul says, well, <laughs> They're just comparing you because we have a war out there, and that's the war of this world. The world is saying that you should measure up to here, that they have these particular standards that we need to measure up and fulfill, that you're supposed to fulfill these, the, your own desires, right, and not be like, held back, right? The world hungers for lots of freedom, and therefore, when we to say, no, we confine our freedom, we constrain our freedom by following the pattern that, life, the pattern that Jesus has given us, the world says, you're not measuring up to our standards then. You're not really human then. You're not fully human, right? And so there's that pain in comparison. And what does Paul say? Well, you are more than conquerors. In Jesus, Jesus is basically beyond comparison. And, if, and remember one of the truths, one of the things that we have to lean on, the foundations, is that we are Jesus' body and Jesus is in us. And who, we're, and who we are and who's inside of us. Amen? And so whenever somebody compares us, who are they really comparing? Jesus. Right? So basically when somebody says, you're not measuring up to our standards, and, then and if they're really saying, Jesus is not measuring up to our standards, you would say, so what? Right? Because Jesus, you can't measure up to Jesus. Jesus is above your standards. It's beyond your standards. And therefore, you're, if you're measuring it against Jesus, well, sorry, man, we win, right? Jesus always win. You, you, you agree? And amen to that. So there is no pain in the comparison when we know for a fact that inside of us, and when we are being compared, remind ourselves, who are they really comparing? They're really comparing Jesus. They're really comparing about Jesus to their standards. It's like, uh, I, remember, um, I remember I gave you a story about when I was in Thailand. And then how everybody's at average height is only five feet, <laughs> right? Sean, looking like you and I probably relate to that. You know, like everybody's like five feet. And then so when I went there, everybody called me Yao Ming, because you know, because I look like Yao Ming, right? Because you know, I'm above everybody, right? See, they're comparing what by their own standards. They're comparing me with their own standards. But if I go anywhere else, I'm just a short Chinese guy, right? So like a same thing here. When the world is comparing us to their own standards, it's very limited. It's only twenty feet, like a rhino. And beyond that, they can't see anything. But we go with the long ball. We would go with the long game. And Jesus says, no, this is eternity. I, I have all these riches, and I am the king of kings, lord of lords. Nothing can compare with me. And so when you are being compared, Jesus reminds us, guess who's in you? Me. And they're comparing me then, not you. All right, let's move on then. Then in chapters 11 and 12, in these two chapters, this particular discomfort 
sorry, discomfort that Paul was enduring comes from being told that he was a fool, remember that, in following Jesus. He was a fool in doing what he was doing. In fact, he was accused of not being a true servant of Christ because he was suffering. Paul, if you're a real good Christian, how come you're suffering? Right? Shouldn't you be like living a good life? Shouldn't Jesus like bless you with good health, wealth, and prosperity? Why are you still being lowered down by a basket that a basket that's being used for fruit, uh, like, uh, and you're running away? Shouldn't you be like this like macho guy in Christ? Well, we knew that, like uh, Paul says, no, Jesus humbled himself. He emptied himself, and that therefore I need to empty myself, folks. We came to a conclusion at that chap at that last week, saying that following Jesus is hard. When the world says, "Hey, do whatever you desire," because if, as long as you fulfill what you desire, you're fully human, we say no. The only person that defines uh, our desires is who? Jesus. And we know that if, as long as Jesus uh, like uh, defines our desires and we fulfill them, we'll be fully human. But the world says, "No way! That is so wrong. That is like that is so wrong." And also. It's so silly because it's not economical because you guys are tithing of all things. That's a dumb thing to do, right? Giving away money, your harder money, especially living in Vancouver. But we say, no, we follow Jesus' pattern. Tithing is a way to empty ourselves and can remain loyal to God and say, God, this is your money, not mine, right? This is the way to follow God's pattern. See, the world says, and currently today, uh, you hear it on the radio, you hear it on the music, especially on uh, when I, I, I do research uh, uh, by listening to music on the radio and see what's going on in people's minds these days. And so a lot of times it's fulfill your desires, do what you uh, enjoy, because, because that's how you become more human or full. Well, that's wrong. Paul says that's foolish because the only person that knows exactly how you can be the best Angela you could be or the best John Luke you could be, or the best angel you could be, the best uh, way when you could be, the best of the best uh, that you that God has created you to be. The only way is to follow Jesus, because He has that pattern for us to live a life that is the fullest of who God made us to be. Each of you have a body, glorious body, waiting in heaven to, for you to achieve, to for you to obtain, not achieve, sorry, obtain. And what is it then? We don't know, but it's going to be a glorious one. And as we follow this pattern, we will like, uh, obtain that glorious body. Amen? All right. So we find comfort at, uh, knowing that as we stand firm, the power of God is also displayed in us. Remember, uh, as we, it is hard, and as we struggle, what did Paul say in the latter chapter, in chapter 12? 12, sorry. He said that this suffering, this uh, enduring, this standing firm is the mark of the true apostle. It's a mark of the true apostle. So take courage. Take, um, take this as an encouragement that as we stand firm against the world's grain, we're actually marked as a true apostle. This will end. This whole trial enduring will end. And thankfully, we do have that one foundation and that God will deliver us. It will end. And uh, as, we, as Pastor Fritz and I are going to head into uh, that book, where, where, where is God when it hurts? Thankfully, the overall tone is that this will end. This will end. This will end. <laughs> right? Because you'll grow up. <laughs> right? Hopefully, past the teenage years, this will end. Right? Okay. Let's go. Um, so this chapter is a little bit of an interesting one because it's, it's at the end. And then uh, uh, a lot of my pastor friends, uh, uh, we were one time discussing this uh, particular chapter and go, how would you preach this? Because, you know, it's a conclusion, <laughs> right? There's not many things here. But then I noticed that, um, and I noticed a little bit of uh, a tidbit, a little highlight, and I hope that you agree with me. And so, like, uh, let's go for this. Uh, to begin, I want to start off with that, um, that this chapter is more like a kickoff to the next series that was coming. Why do I say that? It's more like the, uh, Paul is actually telling the Corinthians, aside from the benediction that he did at the end, it's more about why, giving us one reason, one of many reasons why we do have suffering. Why do we experience weakness in suffering? Okay? 
So that's where we're going to go this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. We'll start there, then we'll go into uh, 13. So uh, it should be on the screen if you don't have your Bibles with you. So I'll begin. For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I am afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier, and I have re not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. And then now let's go to chapter 13. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness. Yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him. Yet by God's power, we will live with him in our dealing with you. Hmm. After two visits, Paul says, and at least four letters, Paul is finding that the Corinthians, some of the Corinthians anyway, are unchanged, right? They're still sinning and have not repented. Now, recall that the Corinthians were a prideful bunch. Do you see like um, how you notice that how pride blinded them of their own sin, right? They, they're so unrepented that they're so blind by the pride that they are not unrepented. Rather, Instead of looking at the plank, you know how Jesus says, instead of looking at the plank in their eye, they're actually looking at the speck in Paul's, right? Because like uh, they're saying how he is uh, not measuring up to their standards and he's suffering and stuff like that. What he's saying that, um, that like, the Corinthians are still asking, demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. Right? They're still wondering, are you really a true apostle because you're suffering so much? Right? So they're actually measuring, up, measuring Paul again. Right? The Corinthians couldn't believe that, that, this life, this Christ, that this life that Paul is following is actually the life of a Christ follower. He's so weak. He suffered. So the Corinthians couldn't believe that. Like they believed, okay, they believed that, you know, from the previous chapters we learned, like this Christian should be squeaky clean, right? Tall, handsome, well-built, healthy, no blemishes, right? Like, uh, but neglect, they neglect the fact, and this is what Paul says, they neglect the fact that actually a Christ-like life has to, have a sh has to show a continuous decrease in, what did he say in this chapter? Lying, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. You follow? It's, it's not about squeaky, cleaning, <laughs> squeaky cleanliness. It's not about law-abiding citizen, right? Though that's important, right? A Christ follower, a true Christ follower, has nothing to do with how well you dress, or how many Bible studies you take, or how or how often you go to church. A true Christ follower sh shows signs of continuous decrease of lying, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. That's what he said. You follow? It has a lot to do with what's in here. So it has to show evidence of continuous transformation, meaning that ever since I baptized Kiefer, the Holy Spirit, we as a body of Christ should see that the Holy Spirit is working in him. And how do we know? By his, by his continuous transformation. You follow? We're watching you. <laughs> all right. So, all right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're just sitting in the front, so you were an easy target. All right. So you, there's that continuous transformation. Here's what I need. Here's a couple of examples that I faced. See, I, I still remember one time uh, when I was having some conversations with uh, some Christians way back uh, before I met Rosanna. Uh, they, a really good friend of mine, <laughs> a really good friend of mine was really caring and she set me up with a blind date. Okay? And then so uh, I go, okay, where is this date going to be, right? And then so uh, lo and behold, it's going to be at Bikram's Yoga. It's heat yoga. All right, where they jack up the, the room temperature to 45 to 50 degrees. Little did I know that what, it was, what I was going into, guess what I was wearing? Sweatpants. Aww. All right, anyway, so I go in, 
<laughs> right? And then I, and then, but then I slowly, okay, after th three grueling sessions, of like, I'm like, okay, I'm starting to get used to this. Okay, now I know what to wear, <laughs> right? And so then I told my Christian friends that I'm doing yoga. I did yoga, right? And then, you know what they said? Oh, that's a sin, <laughs> right? That's horrible. That's so sinful. You're not a Christian then, are you? Why are you doing yoga? I'm like, I'm just doing it for yet exercise, right? In fact, that like it's no longer my, like the date. The date didn't quite work out. <laughs> so it's like you know, why would you send your blind date to Brigham's yoga? But anyway, like um, like uh, but I said, wasn't it just exercise the other day? And lo and behold, it's like uh, they see this uh, yoga as just a blemish of a Christian image. And lo and behold, these are the same people when we went for dinner. Guess what they were talking about? Oh, not enough money. Right? How can I find more tax loopholes? How can I like uh, you know why am I, why are these poor people taking all our tax money? Blah blah blah. Right? So they were more concerned with the image of a Christian than they were concerned about their own hearts. You follow? Image versus the true heart. Note well, again, Paul says lying, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. That pretty much captures a lot of it. Right? So is yoga or fits of rage? Which one's worse, right? Which one is actually the more true identity and mark of a Christian? It's the reduction of rage, selfish ambition, jealousy, gossip, arrogance, and disorder and lying. Agree? Right? Here's another one. I got another example. Uh, Annabelle goes to a private Christian school now. And, uh, you know, so this is parents talk, right? And then we, and then I, they ask that Annabelle, oh, uh, like, what is she doing uh, for extracurricular activities? Uh, expecting piano, right? Um, so <laughs> it's like, uh, and I said, well, she actually plays baseball, basketball, tennis, and then, uh, and currently she loves hip hop dance. <gasps> hip hop, right? Hip hop dance, that is so bad. Right? <laughs> like, how do, like, why would you want to put your Christian girl into a hip hop class, right? And yet, these are the same people, and they're not here, and they don't know because I'm not mentioning any names, right? <laughs> they're, they're the same people who would drive their Mercedes GL5s or whatever, the, the, those that big SUVs come in and then park illegally, and one of them actually moves the, the very cone that they place to prevent them from parking. They actually move the cone to park there. These are the same people that told me that hip hop was bad. Image, Christian image versus the Christian heart. You follow? This is where Paul was getting at with the Corinthians. You are, he's saying, you are disqualifying me as being a true apostle. You're disqualifying me for having the authority because I don't measure up to your image. How many of you have felt that? That people are disqualifying you because you don't measure up to that Christian image? that you don't dress the way they do, or that, that you to do some things that they don't do, right? And Paul says, this is where you have to address that it has nothing to do with the image, it has a lot to do with the heart. It's the continuous transformation of our hearts. And that continuous transformation can, all, can be done by one way, and the one way is through what we're getting at is suffering and weakness. It's our time of weakness. Here, let me explain. Let's move on to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 to 7. Examine yourselves. This is what Brian read to us. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that, you, that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that we will not do anything wrong. Not so that people will see that we have stood the test, but so that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. What is this test? Right? And how do we do it? Or, how, or what does it look like? Right? Well, here's what, if you read the N.T. Wright book, here's what he says. I'll quote. It's by, he says this. When you look at yourself in the mirror, do you see someone in who King Jesus is living and active or someone who once knew him, but now seems not to? Have you ever looked at yourself? Like, is this someone who King Jesus is living and active or someone who just once knew him? When you listen to the sort of things you, you, you yourself say, does it sound like words that might have come from King Jesus himself? Or are you simply talking the same way everyone else does? When you find yourself with your brother and sister Christians, do you respond to them as brothers and sisters, as people in whom you see King Jesus also living? Or are they just other people? And when you settle down and quiet your mind and heart, this is the key here, 
How many of us actually had time to settle down and quiet, quieten your, our minds and heart, to pray and wait for God? Do you know and sense the presence, the life, and the love of King Jesus close to you, within you, warming and sustaining, guarding and guiding, checking and directing you? Question. See, that's the test. That's the test that N.T. Wright says of how you know that you are continually being transformed, that this is no longer about the Christian image, but it's more the Christian heart. Yet I have to challenge this too, because I'm a very practical person, right? How is this test applicable to me, especially now, right? How do I know this? When does this happen? And fortunately, and sometimes unfortunately I see it, fortunately though, by the grace of God, he does actually impose it on us. What do I mean by that? Have any of you know Psalm 23? You know that popular song, the Lord is my shepherd, I don't know. Okay, what, is the, what do most of the verbs sound like? Passive or active? Meaning, is it happening on the author or the author is actually acting it out? He makes me lie down on, uh, on quiet pastures. He leads me to still waters. He guides me through the uh, darkest valleys. Is it him doing it or God doing it? God. And what tools does he use? The rod? and the staff. Those things are pain distributors. Okay, <laughs> all right? Think about it. The Lord is my shepherd. Shepherd's tools, rod and staff. He makes me lie down on quiet pastures. How many of you, Brian, you could probably relate, and I, I probably relate. How many of us have been so busy that we kind of forget life in general, and then we forget to have devotion with God? Many of us. And then suddenly, we get hit by a flu. <laughs> I do. For some reason, every time I get really busy or anxious or stressed, I get sick. And then I'm bedridden. And then at that moment, I feel that I, like, uh, I feel like uh, I just didn't quiet because everything's gone. Like, it's quiet. My phone's off, everything. And then I realize that in that quietness, I start praying. First of all, God, why have you inflicted this pain on me? You know that I have deadlines. Then second, repentance. <laughs> and then, right? And then lastly, you go, man, I should. Then I start reading or I start praying. I, I wonder for you, but I wonder for myself if that is actually God's rod and staff that makes me lie down on quiet pastures. Follow? Because the rod and staff is not comfortable tools. Think about it, right? The rod and staff, the rod is supposed to hit you, right? To stay straight. The staff is a hook, right? A stick with a hook to pull the, you, you out of something. Interesting enough, even in that psalm, it's God who leads us into the darkest valleys. He leads us into them. No, because the sheep, us sheep, we hate going into unknown places, right? Dark places where we don't like unpredictability, right? But then the shepherd goes, no, 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 you go. And then when we fall, don't worry, I'll pick you up with the staff. And then when we don't have no idea where we're going in the dark area, he nudges us. But everything deals with some pain. It's some form of, we're weak. I can't do this alone, right? In the darkest valleys, I can't do this alone. I wonder if, remember what our, uh, our theme is today, is I wonder if uh, like, what Paul is saying, you know this test that we have to give to ourselves, this wondering, you know, and then the suffering that I'm enduring, he's telling the Corinthian, is that, God is telling me to depend on him. That in my weakness, I am strong, that passage. That's what he meant. He's alluding to Psalm 23. Is that, that God is actually telling him, no, I'm reminding you, I'm using my rod staff to make you weak and to make you lie down, to make you vulnerable, to make you realize that you're missing the point and missing the mark and to break down your Christian image. You follow? This is why I'm using this uh, video here, and I'll explain later. But let's go on to uh, chapter 13, verse 4 to 9. He goes like this. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him in our dealing with you. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayer is that you may be fully restored. See, uh, I showed this video, that video there, is because uh, I don't know if you've ever watched the movie, but there's, it gets a little philosophical. 
um, Bruce Wayne, Batman, right? What was the whole main problem in the whole Dark Knight Rises thing? It's because he thought that he could depend on this suit, right? Alfred could challenge him, right? Every time you put on the suit, you depend on him. You depend on the suit to be your savior. To, you think that this suit will save the city, right? Image. It's our image. But then, what really made him realize that he has to be who he actually is, Bruce Wayne? Bane. Bane threw him in the pit, right? And then he, and with no suit. Well, what, what did he, what was he? Like, if you look at the picture here, he's only in his scrub, like kind of scrubs, burlap, whatever, right? He has nothing, right? And then constantly he's trying, he's trying, he's trying to figure it out, but he has nothing. And then the last thing he thought that he could depend on the rope, his prison may say, throw it away. Because you have to be in complete weakness in order to understand who you are to be saved, to, be, to escape from this, right? I wonder if it's that for us too. I know that like, uh, we're talking about finding comfort in God through our suffering and pain, but we also have to maybe kick off for the next uh, uh, series to find why. Maybe one of the reasons why we have suffering and pain is actually God directing us, using his rod and staff to say, hey, look, lie down. Lie down in the quiet pastures. Stop. Be still. Allow me to make you lie down on quiet pastures. Allow me to lead you by the staff to still waters and allow me to take you through the unknown path of Jesus' life pattern that he's going to give you. Maybe at this moment in your life right now, you're wondering where you're headed. What is the purpose in life? Why am I like, stricken with uh, weaknesses? Maybe it is time that like, you allow God to make you lie down in quiet pastures and allow, you, and allow yourself to do this test that N.T. Wright offered, to look at yourself in the mirror again and to say, is this the person that has encountered Jesus and, is, and King Jesus is living and active or, uh, in me? Or is, am I just someone that just once knew him and now life just goes on? Amen? Let's pray.